Hi, good afternoon. This is Chris Hadfield. Hi there, Chris. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks so much for calling in. I really appreciate this. My pleasure. You're in Halifax? I'm in Halifax right now, and I see you're calling from Toronto? I am. Oh, perfect. That's wonderful. Um, so yeah, I was very excited for this. Um, what really made me want to reach out to you is I really love adventure. And this show that I host is all about adventure. I thought you'd be the perfect person to reach out to. So it's very tempting right off the bat for me to ask you about space. But what I really want to know is how you're doing right now and uh, what's, what's occupying your mind nowadays? Uh, I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Busy as can be. I came back uh, recently from an incredible adventure in the high Arctic on a Soviet icebreaker almost to the North Pole and back um, as part of the generator series that we do of sort of investigating uh, ideas as as entertainment, ideas as, as, a, uh, as a, a desirable thing to deliberately be involving yourself in. So the whole generator is keeping me busy. Um, I, uh, I'm writing books, which is a form of adventure on its own. The, the, the third book, uh, The Darkest Dark, is, is looking at the world through the eyes of a child and, and how to distinguish between fear and danger in your life and how to find your way past your fears. And uh, I speak at um, all over the world, and I, I, on a regular basis, I teach at university. I'm playing a fair bit of music. In fact, also, we uh, recorded an album with Danny Michelle uh, up in the Arctic uh, on board the icebreaker called Flemnikoff, and our uh, sort of world premiere of that is here in Toronto uh, on uh, gosh, February 24th, I guess. And then mm. I'm playing with the Halifax Symphony on uh, the weekend, I think it's the 17th, 18th, uh, whatever the Saturday, Sunday is of February as well, music that I wrote. So mm. that's a lovely way to, to talk about and, and share the ideas of the adventures that all of us are on and yeah lots, lots of projects lots of technical stuff too but yeah it's all uh, an interesting mix and uh and uh, helen keller right life is a grand adventure right. or nothing mm-hmm. i'm very excited for you to come down to halifax i see you're going to be joining us at the rebecca con auditorium saturday february 18th and 19th now chris do you get to come down to nova scotia very often I get out pretty regularly. I mean, I travel all the time, and uh, and Canada's uh, a big country, top to bottom and left to right. Um, so I, I get coast to coast to coast pretty regularly. I get to Halifax several times a year. Uh, I have family in town, um, and I speak at the universities and work with businesses there. So yeah, yeah, fairly often. I, I hardly ever get anywhere as often as I'd like, including home. But uh, but that's just the, the nature of, of travel. Uh, but no, I. I uh, I really enjoy my chance to uh, to see Canada and, and to try and stitch it all together in my head to to recognize that the personality and values and history of each place it's when you tie all those together mm-hmm. that, that you uh, that you really have what the country is and I'm lucky enough to get to see a lot of it firsthand it's like like Rick Mercer does only only at a different level absolutely and it's always amazed me how you're able to do so many things you're an astronaut you're a writer you're a musician how are you able to do so many things and be successful at each one of them uh, well sure initially um, be excited about doing the work because mm-hmm. Success, if success comes randomly, then, then often it's very transient and shallow, and, and it's, sometimes it's even hard to recognize as success. But an, a well-earned success, that, that's what life is all about, is, uh, you know, I, uh, it, if you have to climb the mountain, then reaching the peak is far more significant. So I think uh, the first step towards trying to be successful in anything is not only to be ready for the work, but to look forward to the work, That because that's where the real... A fun part, a real adventure happens. Um, and then the second is to try and do things that are personally important and significant to me, things that I really uh, believe in or, or want to do or, or uh, you know, get my heart going. And, and so I, you know, I decided to be an astronaut when I was a child. I always wanted to learn to fly. I always wanted to learn to play guitar. I've mm-hmm. always enjoyed reading and writing. Uh, I, I really enjoyed downhill skiing, water skiing, and you know a bunch of different things, rock climbing and scuba diving. And, and so in each of those, I have always said, what is it I want to accomplish? You know, what is, mm-hmm. what's the end game? 
what skills don't I have yet? What don't I know how to do? Or, or what haven't I done that allows me to do these things I want to do? And let's start working on those skills. Start working on, on laying all the groundwork that maybe someday I'll get to do the thing that right now is just a desire or a dream. And then have sort of this tenacious patience with yourself. Recognize that none of this is going to happen overnight. And, and, that, uh, and that when success comes, it'll often be unrecognized. It, it'll be in multiple, multiple little bumps. If you're an Olympian and you mm-hmm. win a gold medal at the Olympics, by no means is that the only success you've had. And, and it may not end up being the biggest one for you. It's the most visible, maybe the most easily measured, but the years and years and years that get you to the point where someone might give you a gold medal, in there, there are countless uh, the stories and, and successes. And that's where the real interesting parts all happened. The description of crossing the finish line is, is at best a, a transient taste in the mouth. So I, so I, that's how I look at it all. And, and then finally, I, I try and do stuff that um, I, I try not to do things that I know I'm bad at. <laughs> so, <laughs> that makes sense. It improves my chances of success. So right. if I know, like I, I, I would love to be able to pick up a pen or, or an ink set and be Norman Rockwell or, <laughs> or Michelangelo or something, but I, I just can't. I don't have that ability. And if I work really hard at it, I can, I can draw better and, and well enough for my purposes. But, mm-hmm. but I, I recognize that that uh, it's better to focus on the things that not only am I passionate about that, but also that that I have uh, of some sort of knack for because that combination is is really killer when you get them both going at once. Definitely. I, I watched your TED Talk and you were talking about being a nine-year-old boy and wanting to go to space. You also talked about fears and, and conquering them and, and conquering them through practice and repetition. So Chris, what are you afraid of? Well, I think uh, fear is natural and normal and, and really necessary. Fear is what keeps us alive. Uh, but uh, knowledge and skill are what will allow us not to be afraid. Because mm-hmm. when you're little, you know, if you're a chihuahua or if you're a young, a, a new person, mm-hmm. then you have really very little to go on. You don't have many skills. You don't have much ability to, to, uh, to understand what's happening. And so therefore, everything is dangerous and therefore you're afraid all the time but it, like um like riding a bike mm-hmm. when you're i mean when you're born you can't ride a bike and when you're that young person first setting out to ride a bike and you're transitioning from tricycle to training wheels to whatever it's naturally a little scary because you don't have the skill yet but once you've mastered it once you've gained a skill then bike riding stops being scary even though bike riding didn't change bike riding is exactly the same your skill level changed and so therefore you can now go fast you can feel the wind in your face you can cover distance you can i mean it's it's a uh, it's a freedom that comes through changing who you are so that you no longer just are a chihuahua shivering in fear and really everything is like that and and, and so I, when you ask what am I afraid of, I'm afraid of the things that I'm unprepared for, you know, the, whatever my current version of riding a bike is, or, or things that are going to have a significant impact on my life that I cannot control or, or I cannot have an input into. So I, I, I try and make a reasonable judgment about what is it that I'm afraid of that I can affect, that I can mm-hmm. change. How can I improve my skill? Like if... Um, for example, I'm giving a talk at a, at a huge conference in Trondheim, Norway, coming up in, in March. Mm-hmm. And I'm speaking to thousands of people. I've never met any of them. I'm talking on a topic I don't necessarily always talk about. So for a lot of people, that would make you afraid. You know, stand up in a strange place where English isn't their first language. Talk about a topic you're not too comfortable in in front of a bunch of strangers and, and try and be the headliner. So practice. Practice. Figure it out. Do the research. Understand the place. Uh, do the historical study. 
write the speech and then practice the speech over and over and over again until you can take the speech 15 different directions and they're all going to be worth doing it. And then when you get there, really engage and 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 make it uh, as informed and interesting. Put yourself in the position of the audience. You know, really uh, mm-hmm. change who you are. Treat it like riding a bicycle until I can do it with, my, with no hands. You know, I want to be able to give that talk with my hands off the handlebars and, and still be able to effectively ride. And I right. think that difference, that difference between fear and danger, recognizing that, uh, that they're not the same thing at all. But in fact, danger is life. Fear is your lack of preparation for life. And you don't have to be afraid mm. if you make the effort and, and, uh, and do your best to, to constantly prepare for the things that are inevitably about to happen. Absolutely. And and I really believe that once you practice things and repeat things and you pick up experience, it really makes you more comfortable with whatever you're doing. But Chris, do you have any advice for when life throws us a curveball and we're faced with a situation we haven't practiced for, something we haven't foreseen? Well, why wouldn't you practice? I mean, so so if, sit down someday and say, okay, what are the 10 most likely things that might happen that, I, that I'm not ready for? Like, I don't know, make up your own list. The person sitting next to me starts choking. Mm-hmm. Or, um, I, I don't know, the, the world climate goes up four degrees. Or right. uh, my, one of my family members passes away. Mm-hmm. Or it doesn't matter. Whatever list is important to you are the things perhaps that you fear the most. Because if you fear them the most, that probably means you're, you're the least prepared for that list of things. And then... In, in the time that you might otherwise be doing nothing or, or, or you know, looking mm-hmm. at cat videos on YouTube, <laughs> actually look at what what is, so let's just treat it like you would anything else. Say, okay, let's assume this is happening. What am I unprepared for? What skills don't I have yet? If it's a loved one dying, let's, let me just pretend that it happened for a minute or for, or for 10 minutes. Who am I going to phone? Mm-hmm. How am I going to... Do I do I understand how will and probate work? What lawyer do I call? Do, what do you what do you do with the body? What do you you know just actually go through it? Don't right. don't just sit there with your fingers crossed, feeling uncomfortable and fearful. But actually spend the time when it's not actually happening to to, to gain your skill a little bit, and it'll still be very emotional and significant when it happens. But mm-hmm. you won't be just just dealing with it in a completely unprepared manner. And you and that's really just sort of a way of life. Don't just cross your fingers and hope life is going to go okay. But, uh, use I mean sometimes you can't control it, but but it, your own particular set of skills is almost inevitably the straight result of your own decision making. So just just treat it that way. And it, to me it, it's it just makes things more fun. You don't you don't spend the day dreading things. Instead, you kind of look forward to stuff more often, I think, because you've spent the time uh, improving your ability to deal with them. So I, don't know, I, I just treat it as a mindset, and and I think it leads to more adventure in life, more more interesting things happening, more uh, ability to deal with what's happening and see maybe the humor and the joy and the fun and the and the depth of what's happening around you instead of the overwhelming nature of of fear and unpreparedness. I love that. And about going to space, when you first went there and you were exposed to that completely new environment, how did you feel? Uh, It was an enormous amount of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I decided to be an astronaut when I was nine, about to turn 10. And my first flight into space, I was 35. So it took 26 years of preparation. And... Mm -hmm. And, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I went to four different universities and became a pilot, and then a fighter pilot, and a test pilot, and and also, and then I studied for several years purely as an astronaut, training specifically for that day. And the most complicated bicycle I ever rode <laughs> is, is to fly a space shuttle, and and it's not something you know. It took four of us to fly it. I wasn't the, by any means the commander or the only person on board of that space shuttle, but four of us operating that complex ship. So that's. That's wonderful to doing something that is really, really hard mm-hmm. and doing it well as a result of, of what the changes you've made in yourself. Because I sure wasn't born uh, as an astronaut or someone who could fly a spaceship. It, it's a learned skill, but it, 
by, by doing all that work, it put me in a position to have an adventure that is almost unique in the entire human experience to, mm-hmm. to be able to fly a rocket ship and leave the planet and then go around the world every 92 minutes in, in, a, in this little weightless island that is a spaceship, you know, where you are floating around magically weightless with the entire world pouring past out the portals of the spaceship. It's, it's uh, unbelievably magnificent to be there. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, you're not there randomly. You also have this great sense of comfort that you're there as the result of, of an enormous amount of, of, of tenacious patience and, and, and preparation and a lot of small decisions through your life, which makes it all the sweeter. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's a, it's a one, and it, you know, I was afraid, what if I don't like it? What if I put all this work into it and, and I don't like it? But like a lot of those things, especially if you're prepared for them, they, they're better than you dreamed they would be because of all the nuances that you couldn't properly anticipate. And when you first looked out that window in space and you look back at Earth, what went through your mind? What, what were you feeling? Well, you launch a rocket ship and rocket ships don't fly themselves. They're, it's the most dangerous thing I've done in my whole life was to help be part of the crew flying Space Shuttle Atlantis on uh, November the 12th, 1995. Uh, and it takes about nine minutes from mm-hmm. lying on your back on the ground to be going uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour, uh, a million feet up, weightless in, in the empty vacuum of space. It's, and that happens in nine minutes. So you can't uh, ignore that when you ask, what's it like to look out the window? Mm-hmm. Be- because the two of them are, are immensely tied e- emotionally and psychologically and, and technically in your mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think if, if you were just, you know, sitting in a chair in your office and suddenly you looked out the window and the whole world was going by, that would be one sensory experience. Right. It's different when it when it's kind of the fruit of the labor of, of your life. Um, but that doesn't diminish the uh, spectacular gorgeousness of our planet. If you launch out of Florida, the first time you can get to the window, you're basically coming south of London. Mm-hmm. England and just just cutting across into um, into the middle of Europe and, and cut down over the med there and so so often by the time the engines have shut off and you've unstrapped and tucked away your equipment and and you have to immediately float to the window and grab a big camera and take photographs of the big external gas tank because that lets us understand the health of the system mm-hmm. in the background is the world and that was my first view of the world uh, and. You have a, a very clinical, technical part of you, the, the engineer, test pilot, astronaut part of you that is focusing the camera and making sure you get clean, crisp photographs of this big piece of hardware in the external tank. But the other half of you is this is this crazy, excited, little young person screaming with joy at what is going on, where you are, the that the world is, is pouring by at five miles a second underneath you. Wow. And 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 you're you're floating weightless next to a window taking pictures of it. It's <laughs> it is it is uh, uh, it's it's the best roller coaster sensation you've had in your life. But it's permanent and it goes on for the whole time you're there. And and so it's uh, it's it's wondrous. Do you miss it? No, no, I don't miss. <laughs> uh, no, I I. I I spend very little time missing stuff. You know, I like what I'm doing next. You know, mm-hmm. that's it, it, uh, I. There's been a lot of stuff I've done in my life. I guess you could spend your whole time looking backwards, missing things that have already happened. But right. then, then, what are you going to miss ten years from now? <laughs> I love that. That's so true. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, yeah. I think instead you should use your life's experiences to help appreciate more completely what's happening now and and where you want to go next and and what you want to be doing next i love it not wallow in the past just because then uh then i I guess the adventure is stopped if uh, if that's how you're looking at it i I don't think you should ignore it and i but i think what you've done up until today has brought you to the level of awareness and, and education and capability with which you're going to do the things that you're doing next in your life. And that, 
that to me is the great adventure of life, not just resting on the laurels of, of, of the ghost of Christmas past. And now, Chris, looking at what's in the future for you with your music and your writing and your, your, your speaking engagements, what's coming up next for you? Oh, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm going to be hosting a series for National Geographic called One Strange Rock, mm-hmm. looking at the world and, and thinking about it. Um, sort of from the perspective, the high above perspective that I've had. And so that's an interesting project. And we're starting into filming that here in the late spring. And then I'm hosting a series for BBC um, doing an astronaut selection because a lot of people are curious, what would it really take? And we're only having a dozen people, but I think like 2,500 people applied to be on this show so they could go through the, the reality of an astronaut selection and, and, uh, and see what it truly takes in order to be trusted to fly a spaceship. So those two projects are fun. Uh, I, um, I just recorded, I mentioned, recorded an album with Danny Michelle called Klebnikov, which was the name of the Soviet icebreaker we were on. And mm-hmm. I, I wrote one song on it and, and, and contributed to another one, but it's mostly Danny Michelle's album. But we're uh, doing a, a premiere of that album at Harbor Front in Toronto on the whatever the 24th so that I'm looking forward to that that's a lot of fun and we've had a show at the Art Gallery of Ontario from the photographers we had along and and then a, um, a couple of videographers Ben Brown and Tim Kellner so so that that's been a lot of uh, a lot of fun and we're looking at what to do next with generator the idea of bringing a team of people and technology to be able to show people a part of the world that otherwise they would never see and not in a not in a sort of a, an agenda documentary fashion, but more using YouTube and using mm-hmm. uh, digital photography and, you, and writing and music to try and, and let people truly see and sense what a part of the world might be. You know, what if it was the mm-hmm. jungles of Rwanda or, the, or 82 degrees north up the Tanqueray Fjord or, or wherever? Most of us never actually get to see most of the world, but technology allows us to experience it maybe in a more visceral way than we've ever done in the past. And, and so our, our generator projects are, um, are, are part of trying to make that happen. And the big show we put on at Massey Hall in Toronto every year is sort of a stage version of that. And the next book, I'm, I'm, I've written a book for adults and, and the one for little kids called it's called The Darkest Dark about dealing with fear. Right. And then one book in images of the world called Around the World, 92 Minutes, You Are Here. But the next book I think will be um, for young adults, taking some of the, actually some of the ideas you and I are talking about yeah. and trying to present them in a way that, are, that that is appropriate for an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old so that they can, they can, because they're not little kids anymore. Right. It's not a fantasy world, but they're by no means adult. They're not even adolescent, mm-hmm. but they're still making important decisions about their life and what people like me don't do. That's a really important mm-hmm. decision to make. What, what do you internalize at eight years old? What do people like me not do? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that can be a, an immense life-shaping decision. And so I, I, our next book probably will be for uh, young adults or, or eight-year-old to 13-year-old kind of ages with as many useful ideas and presented in a way that, that is as uh, interesting and engaging and as accessible for, for young people as we can make it. I, I think that will be the next book. And then I'm helping with Canada's Nest Astronaut Selections, so that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. We're going to hire hire two people and um, and over uh, over 8,000 people put in wow. some sort of application and and I think we're down below 100 now so that's that's an interesting project to be part of and I've been part of Canada's Space Advisory Board and um, mm. I'm working with an interesting co- company in um, the Halifax area called Nautel that is building the solid state electronics for a, a space ion propulsion engine. So that that's uh, and I and I'm teaching at University of Waterloo and I really enjoy. I only do it part time, but that's that's something I really look forward to every time as well. So it, yeah, it's uh, it's it's busy, but it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun and and, uh, and a lot of work. But uh, what can be better than that work that you love doing, that you feel is worthwhile, that um, that at the end of the year you can look back and go, this this was an interesting year. I did some some fun stuff, fun stuff, and, and look at all these next things that are happening. Absolutely, um, I'm really interested with the Halifax project as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about Nautel? Yeah, they um, they're a successful electric 
electronic company. They build a lot of different things. But in order to go beyond the moon, yeah, mm-hmm. um, right now we just use uh, chemical engines, rockets that everybody's familiar with. Mm-hmm. We burn a whole bunch of fuel, basically fossil fuel engines. And, you know, there's a reason we use fossil fuel. It's readily available and it's, it's very powerful and such. But you, that's not how we're going to go to Mars. We, that would be crazy. Right. Uh, unless we really had to go to Mars to try and just fire an engine crazy like for 15 minutes and then coast for six months, that's not the right way to go. That, you right. know, that that's just doesn't, it's like if you wanted to sail from Canada to Australia, you wouldn't accelerate like crazy and then drift for six months. You know, <laughs> no. That doesn't make sense. Exactly. So, and so one of the leading engines is being designed by a, a, a guy named Franklin Chang Diaz, a friend, really brilliant guy, a, a PhD and an ex-astronaut called Ed Astra. And he is a, an ion propulsion engine, but it needs really complex and capable electronics in it. And the best company in the world to supply those electronics is right there, just just uh, around the curve, just south of Halifax, on the way down to Peggy's Cove, I guess, and uh, called Nautel. And they have the they're building them. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's, it's, it's really cool for Canada. It's great for that company, all the people that work there. But it also it's, you know, when, when the first people step on Mars, however long that's going to take us, you know, it could well be because of the, the, the challenge uh, uh, faced and won by that group of people working there just in the outskirts of Halifax, which is, which is pretty cool when you think of Absolutely. how we do stuff together and, and the enormous, unprecedented adventure of interplanetary travel. It seems crazy. It does. But, it really does. But going to the moon was crazy. Building a space station with 15 countries of the world. We've been living off the Earth for more than 16 years, permanently, continuously. There, there has not been a second in the last 16 and a half years where human beings have been living off the planet. And so things that sound crazy become normal uh, faster than most people recognize. And and uh, we'll go from the space station to the moon and eventually to Mars, just, just like we've explored all over the surface of the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to be based purely on other people's ability to imagine and then work and then come up with ideas practical ways to solve it and then uh and then cooperate with other people to put it all together and that's so yeah there's there's lots of great stories like that around the world and around the country but uh, not a great example absolutely and what do you think about the future of interplanetary travel would you ever go to mars um well so we've already sent a uh, human-made probes out of the solar system mm-hmm. uh, the, lo- the little voyagers we launched in the 70s are basically beyond the solar system, so well beyond Pluto. Of course, we drove right by Pluto fairly recently, had a close-up look. We've been driving around on the surface of Mars. We have multiple satellites on Mars. We landed on Titan. We're, we're dipping down really close to the uh, the North Pole of, of uh, Jupiter with Juno and, and Saturn. We're, we're, we're driving inside the rings of Saturn with the Cassini probe here fairly shortly. So... We have interplanetary travel. Mm-hmm. You know, we've we've been sending things interplanetary for a long time. The real question is, when are we going to be good at it enough that we could maybe send people? You know, not just right. a message in a bottle floating across the Atlantic, but but people. And and we're still a ways from that. There's no big rush, and it's it's, it's the way we do it right now is is so hard. It's crazy expensive. Oh yeah. But th- that that's true of most exploration it used to be crazy to go to antarctica like Mm -hmm. impossible and kill people all the time and now thousands of people live in antarctica and a hundred of us live at the south pole year round so so uh interplanetary travel it's 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 somewhere in the barely possible realm right now but with the pace of invention and the restless, educated nature of our ability to uh, to come up and, with ideas and implement them. Uh, whether I'll get to go or not, I don't know. I, I, I think I've been pretty lucky. I'd, I'd love, love to be more a part of, uh, of making that possible, making that part of what is what is a uh, thing that people do. Mm-hmm. But but it's it's you need to be patient. You need to, mm-hmm. and, and you need to recognize that the invention of the ability to do it is 99% of it. And that's, that's, so that's where the fun is. That's where the adventure is. Not mm-hmm. just in, in the moment where you cross the finish line or plant the flag, 
but in the actual doing and, and, and discovering and inventing and creating, that's, that's the really human part. And, uh, and I have been involved in that for the last 20 years, mm-hmm. but I'll, I'll, I'll probably be sitting in a rocking chair watching somebody else <laughs> live on the moon or, or maybe even getting all the way to Mars. We'll see. Now, Chris, do you think outside of the field of science that opportunities to travel to other planets will open for people from different walks of life, from different career paths? Or do you think it's going to be limited to only people in the science and medical fields? Well, uh, that's, so if it were 1917 instead of 2017, you could ask me that question about air travel. Because in 1917, air travel was crazy and dangerous and only and no real commercial service and, you know, sort of fledgling. But then the World War I going on and so some rapid advances being made in technology. But air travel, I mean, nobody was flying across the ocean yet. They don't, it had only been a few years since they'd flown across the English Channel. Right. And, and, and so you could ask that exact same question about air travel in 1917. And my answer, I think, would have been the same, which is, well, why not? The, the technology is brand new. We, we don't know what we're doing yet. Our technology is fledgling. But uh, all it's doing is opening doors, and we're getting better and better at it every year. And so to say never is just sort of a denial of the, of the in, inexorable march of history. But to say soon or when, that, that's just guessing. Who knows? Because sure. we have to invent things. In 1917, we, 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 were, we, we had no idea. Uh, I mean, we just had sort of had the earliest type of very unreliable engines. The radial engine was, wasn't even really invented. The inline engine and properly air-cooled and then streamlining was still well over a decade in the future. And jet engines were still 25 years in the future. And those are the inventions that have allowed us to make air travel something that pretty much anybody can do. So we're sort of at that early stage in space travel where uh, there's no way that it's going to happen right away because we have to invent a lot of things. And it's harder than air travel. But that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's just a matter of of human invention and patience and, uh, and, and being a decent student of history, I think. That's fantastic. And thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate the conversation. I wanted to know if there's anything you want to leave our audience with, a word of inspiration or just anything at all. Oh, just that um, there's adventure every single day. And the key, I think, to enjoying life is to notice it. You know, when you're taking a dog for a walk or if you're sitting and reading a book or if you're watching a program that is about something new or if you're holding a flower in your hand or whatever there's there's a million things you don't know and and there's never been a time in history where information was was more available than it is now so i i think it's a wonderful time in history for adventure and um and then it's just a matter of the personal choice of who you're going to be today and tomorrow and the week after that yeah and i hope folks have a chance yeah, I, don't know, I think they may be sold out already but for the uh the with the halifax or the the symphony that i'm going to be playing with uh, coming up in a few weeks i'm really looking forward to that it's a lovely way to talk about the ideas of it and celebrate it through images and words but most importantly through music and, and the privilege of playing with a symphony you know to fill in all of that soundtrack of life is, is just a great joy for me so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to being there and, and playing in a few weeks and is there a song you're looking forward to performing the most oh, all of them all of them i love it yeah it, it's uh i'm only choosing songs that uh that are important and beloved to me so yeah it, it'll it'll be uh a fun evening i'm sure absolutely well i can't wait to see you chris thank you so much for the phone call and i really appreciate it just have yourself a wonderful night um i'm excited for the future thank you thanks nice to chat with you take care take care bye